Thank you, Justine, and thank you very much for listening. So uh, most of this work has been done at Oak Ridge in collaboration with UT, as Justine has pointed, that's kind of going to slowly transition. Uh, uh, thankfully, when I worked at Oranel, I had to travel 20 minutes to the north. Now I have to travel 20 minutes to the east. Uh, the two places are really very close. And uh, uh, kind of to follow the well-known uh, drama, your owner, I object. I'm not going to talk about futuristic applications. I'm going to talk about the applications of machine learning and microscopy, which are absolutely real, uh, which work right now and which can be deployed basically on any machine that has some form of the uh, hyper command language and uh, Python interface. But let me first start with a little bit of uh, a little bit of justification. So as, I, you, as all of you know, there is this wonderful class of materials, metal halide perovskites, that were discovered essentially 12 years ago or so. And it turns out that these materials are absolutely amazing for a variety of applications, such as uh, photovoltaics, of course, flexible photovoltaics, light emitting diode, chemical sensors. Basically, choose your favorite application and uh, hybrid perovskites and generally inorganic perovskites can do this. So uh, it turns out that uh, our colleagues at uh, University of Tennessee has been studying them for quite a while. So they have a classical program synthesizing uh, the films. Uh, they have a high throughput synthesis. So basically the robot that synthesizes these materials. And once they make the films, they study the chemical homogeneity. So for example, if you take a film of the cesium from a medium lead iodide, anneal it, uh, at different temperatures, take it in the top stems and get a map of the chemical distribution inside the material, you can see that the perovskite is very inhomogeneous. And in fact, depending on how much cesium you put in the system, the phase separation and chemical homogeneity is different. So they can do a slightly different type of experiment. They can take the same perovskite film, bring it to cathode luminescent uh, setup. So here you shine the electron beam on the sample, you detect the light emitted uh, from the sample locally, and uh, basically light emission from the hybrid perovskite tells you about what phase is it, uh, what are the strain effects, what are the compositions, so the usual uh, band gap engineering. And one thing that we find out is that the film that looks absolutely normal under the SEM or AFM actually has very significant homogeneity both in CL and uh, and uh, top sim. The question we ask, can we establish the relationship between this uh, local chemical and physical homogeneity and transport property? So the IV behavior on the, on the light and without. So this is a very standard problem. Uh, we have solved uh, similar problems for 20 years now using the PFM. And uh, the typical setup here is that imagine that I have some interesting objects, for example, Parallelic domain structure, hybrid perovskite. And let's assume that I want to perform some form of spectroscopic measure. So in PFM, this can be the uh, typical hysteresis loop. For hybrid perovskite, they can be local IV measurement. Uh, it can be forced distance curve. It can be non indentation. So, how are we going to select the right locations in order to do the measure? So the first answer is, of course, uh, how about we do the measurements everywhere? Just define a very dense grid of points, take our measurements everywhere, and then analyze the data afterwards. That's doable. This is something that we have been doing at ORNL for uh, more than 15 years. But this approach is limited. So first of all, it takes a lot of time. Secondly, many AFM measurement modalities are actually destructive. If we take the hysteresis slope, we change the domain configuration. If we take the IV measurement, we can accumulate the damage inside the material. If we do nano-indentation, then um, we make a big hole. So the question becomes, can we select the locations for measurements using some logic? And uh, this logic is very domain dependent. And for example, for ferroelectric, I will proceed as follows. 
I will say, look, these are in-plane domains. I just know that there is no interest in physics here. However, being a good experimentalist, I will take several measurements here and here to determine the baseline of my microscope. Then I will take the measurements in these locations because they are most represented in the image. And if the results of the measurement in all these locations are the same, I will say that my uh, spectroscopic data is represented. And then I personally will choose this location where, because here I see the income measure domain region, so there may be some interesting physics because of strain. And some of my colleagues, uh, for example, on the Marazov in Ukraine, will say that, look, uh, we have the parallax domain wall with a very sharp corner. We think that there can be interesting flux electric effects here. How about we do measurements here? So notice that uh, in this, this logic is, uh, obvious for any domain scientist, but when we choose the locations as the domain scientist, we sort of inform our decision using the prior hypothesis. And uh, the question that we ask, can we tell, teach the microscope to follow this logic? So how can we do this? So obviously the first type of this measurement is where we know in advance what type of structures we are interested in, we tell our microscope to discover the structures in real time, and then we perform the measurements on this structure zone. So this can be done by supervised machine learning. So what you see here is the Python plugin for the uh, microscope that works in real time. It acquires the data and in real time converts this data to the ferroelastic wall position and the uncertainty of our data. So you can say, okay, this is a very simple data set. You just see the dark lines here. Uh, you are kind of right, but not really. Look, look at this dark line here. So this is a ferroelectric wall. This is a ferroelastic wall. Our neural network finds only ferroelastic wall and ignores the ferroelectric one, which is actually also dark line. So it's not as simple as it looks. And for the record, it actually took quite a lot of time to learn how to make the network that work in the real time. It's exactly the same problem as uh, self-automated driving. However, once we find the locations of interest, we can basically tell the microscope, go and take the measurements only on the ferroelastic wall. You can see that in this case, uh, we measure the hysteresis loop only in the locations marked by dots, and we use the height of this loop as the color code. And you can immediately see that uh, the two sides of the ferroelastic domain are different, simply because the domain is tilted. There is other variation that we don't quite understand. So for example, you can see that here, this height is large, here it becomes smaller. So there is some additional factors of variation uh, inside the system, maybe because the system is labile with respect to formation of another domain. If it works on ferroelectric, we can make it work on hybrid ferroscale. So the same approach, we take the image, we analyze it in real time, to find all the domain walls, uh, oh, sorry, grain boundaries, and then we can run the measurement when we sample the grains and grain boundaries equally. So notice that the yellow dot is uh, the dot where we sample IV behavior within the grain. And the blue dot is the behavior when we sample it with the grain boundary. So we have sampled both, but we give them uh, equal statistical weight. If we use the not normal grid, most of our sampling points wouldn't even hit the grain boundary. And then we can see interesting things. For example, if we look at things like Fernon voltage or the hysteresis and plot the distribution across the grain boundaries, we can see that the grain boundary is actually different. You can see that, for example, this grain boundary has the strongly insulating region, and some grain boundaries actually have the conductive. And the interesting point would be to correlate it further with the TL and the toxin measure. But then you can ask a question look, in this case, you said that you are interested in the grain boundary properties, uh, but what if you try to pose the inverse problem? For example, can you discover which microstructural elements are responsible for low turn-on volt? Or which microstructural elements in the material are, are associated with the maximum hysteresis? So it turns out that we actually can uh, do this inverse discovery problem and that is probably the first example when machine learning does something for microscopy that humans cannot do. So the trick here is to use the technique called the deep kernel learning. 
uh, which basically is a hybrid of the deep convolutional network and Gaussian process. So I'm not going to go into the detail because I still haven't figured out how to explain it in a few minutes, but I will be delighted to talk about it in further detail if uh, there is some technical interest. Let me just illustrate how it works. So this is the example of the algorithm running on the microscope. When we tell the microscope to discover the regions inside the material that have the maximum hysteresis loop open. So you see how the Python environment talks to the microscope. And this is the result. So uh, here you see the discovery of the regions with the maximum hysteresis loop area on field. Here you can see the results of the discovery of the hysteresis loop area off field. The dots on this image are the measurement steps. So we did 200 measurements. That's relatively small. The grid would be 40,000, sorry, 4,000. And uh, the color of the dot means the sequence in which the microscope took the measure. So what you can see here is that microscope start uh, as a random exploration in the beginning. Then it start to discover that the maximum hysteresis loop area is associated with the ferroelectric wall. And then it basically found the ferroelectric wall. And that makes perfect sense because in the on-field condition, the wall can wobble. What's remarkable is that for the off-field, the same uh, algorithm covers that uh, the maximum hysteresis loop opening is associated with one of the ferroelastic. Again, it explored different part of the sample in the beginning that it discovered the region with the right physical behavior, and then it discovered all other regions that have this type of interesting behavior. So that's really interesting because uh, in this case, the answer is uh, understandable by human, but we can write in this experiment that the scenarios which are not understandable by human. Then, of course, we can have to spend uh, for example, we did this experiment for hybrid perovskite and it works. We just don't know what the results mean because there are no clearly identifiable domain elements. And the third thing that I want to illustrate is the use of machine learning as a part of microscope to discover new physical laws. So this goes in a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, esoteric area of machine learning, which is called the structured Gaussian processes. So it's interesting because uh, there are a lot of very good books on the Bayesian optimization. They typically say that, okay, we are going to choose the uh, process with the zero mean function and work only on the current. So it turns out, and the justification is that the mean function comes from the domain. So unfortunately, uh, if we want to study physics by machine learning, we need to do the whole development ourselves, but we did it. And we basically incorporate it in the framework that we call the hypothesis active learning. So the idea here is that imagine that we have a measurement system. It can be microscope, it can be chemical synthesis, it can be some kind of sampling of combinatorial array, it doesn't matter. So the result of this uh, uh, measurement is a single physical measurement. So we pass this physical measurement to this um, uh, algorithm. And the second component that we give the algorithm is the hypothesis about the system. So it can be model, several list of models with some probabilities, and each model comes with a certain uh, uh, priors on the parameter distribution. What the algorithm does is that given the models and given the physical measurement, it does two things. It updates the model probability and parameters, the usual, uh, usual active learning, but it also suggests the next measurement point that can advance our physical understanding much faster. In other words, much like experimentalist knows how to choose the next experiment in such a way as to come to the answer as quickly as possible, the algorithm uses the principle of minimization of uncertainty in order to choose the next experiment. So implementation of hypothesis learning uh, takes some effort because First and foremost, you need to understand your system well enough to formulate the hypothesis about how it can behave. And uh, kind of after doing the PFM for almost 25 years, the system that is natural for me is the tip and use domain switch. So it's a very simple experiment. We apply bias to the probe, then we form a domain. So the question is what determines the size of the domain formed under the tip? And it can be thermodynamically limited. It can be limited by the wall pinning, as has been explored in detail by Patricia Paruch, or it can be limited by the charge injection. So unless we inject the screening charges on the sample surface, uh, the domain cannot switch. 
So this forms our hypothesis. And uh, this is the implementation of the hypothesis learning on the microscope. So what happens here is that the microscope first starts with the initialization of the region. So we automatically switch the material to be in the uniform domain state. Uh, then we tell our uh, tip to go to a selected location and apply a bias. So we write the domain in automatic fashion. After that, uh, we tell the microscope to scan this region again and uh, visualize the domain that is formed in the, under the bias. So, and then as you can imagine, the next step is we are going to uh, train our algorithm. And while the algorithm is trained, we tell the microscope to switch our ferroelectric domain back. So we prepare for the next experiment. So this is uh, the control parameters here are the M bias pulse magnitude and the time. So this is a standard uh, control parameters. And uh, the experiment is run in the fully automated uh, manner. So the algorithm selects what bias parameters to choose, uh, uh, tells the microscope to do it, measures the domain size. Uh, domain size is used to put an algorithm, and the, uh, and the process is repeated over and over again. So here you see how it happens. So this is the phase image. This is the determination of the domain size. And uh, this is the pulse parameter. So the uh, sequence in which the points appear is the sequence in which microscope is planning the experiment. So what you see here is the uh, number of times specific model for the domain switching is used. And this is what we call the reward, meaning uh, which of the models is better. So as you can see, first we do some random warm-up stages. Uh, then we turn on this uh, hypothesis learning. And uh, in the beginning, all the models are roughly the same. Then you can see that the microscope kind of spends some time being uncertain, sort of much like a human. And then after a while, it chooses the model number. So again, the answer makes sense. This is just the pinning of the domain wall. But uh, the important thing that this is a example of fully autonomous discovery system. And of course, if we've done it for PFM, we can run exactly the same type of protocol for IV measurements. We can run it for the non-indentation. We can run it for the force distance curve. It's just a matter of what type of physics you want to discover and what type of uh, priors of your system behavior do you have. You have three minutes left. Absolutely. So just uh, kind of to uh, summarize, you know, when machine learning started to appear, there was uh, as uh, a thing, there was a lot of speculation that, well, machine learning may take over the science work. This is not going to happen for at least one specific reason, which is that when we put an experiment, we have a specific reward in mind. What do we want to learn? So reward is determined in the context of the specific scientific field. The experiment is planned based on the prior knowledge. Machine learning doesn't have access. So what machine learning can help us with is to make fast, uh, low latency, low level decisions, and it can work hand in hand with the scientists that make high level flow decisions. So another thing you can ask, okay, what you showed us great, uh, is it limited to just one location like band excitation was for 15 years, or is it something that we can do on our microscope? The answer is as long as your microscope comes with the Python plugin, so you can send the data to the Python environment, send control commands from Python to the microscope, you can do everything that I've shown. So uh, this code is uh, freely open on the GitHub, on the uh, GPAX and microscopy domains. And we have several uh, repositories on Medium or YouTube that sort of explain it in the, uh, on the fairly uh, simple level. So uh, thank, you, you know, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I will be delighted to take the question. Thank you so much. This was really, really interesting. Um, Maybe maybe I start already with a question. Is there any um, technical requirements for basically the computer to run this on? Uh, not as much as you would think. So interestingly enough, uh, the simple Gaussian processing, which is the uh, basic algorithm, is very computationally intensive. So the first time we did it two years ago, it required the DGX box and so on and so forth. Deep kernel learning and structured Gaussian processes 
are remarkably light algorithms. So in most cases, they can just try and run on the GPU, on the graphic card inside the microscope. So they can be run on something like uh, Raspberry Pi or uh, something like uh, Xavier, uh, Xavier from NVIDIA. So it is not computationally intensive. Okay, thank you so much. Is there um, any other questions from the audience? You can um, either raise your hand to ask a question directly or um, enter your question into the Q&A. Um, Tobias Kramer, you can, you can ask your question. <clears throat> okay, thanks, thanks for the talk. Uh, like for me now, the question arises, like, is it more efficient to have a instructed student taking the decisions when he's doing a FM experiment or the um, machine learning algorithm? We have already experience on that. <laughs> I mean, it's a complex question because uh, you see, when you run the machine learning workflow, you need to define the why you are doing, which is the reward function. Uh, the reward function can be a curiosity or empowerment. So curiosity means that you want to learn as much about the system uh, variability. Empowerment means that you want to find out how to change the system uh, in the most effective manner. But you see. Uh, the definition or mathematical formulation for this concept can be non-trivial. So unsurprisingly, I said in the very beginning that the choice of what is interesting or not is very much uh, domain and person dependent. So algorithm can do it in the unbiased way, following whatever formulation you get. But human will pay attention to the interesting phenomena very different from algorithm. And different humans have a different, a different interest. So I would say that for the foreseeable future, it would be a humans and algorithm working hand in hand, because uh, actually formulating this reward and making sure that they're robust with respect to microscope non-ideality is maybe non-trivial. So for example, if you forget to do the plane subtraction of your data, you will find out that the algorithm will start measuring on one point. But you know, it's a learning process and uh, kind of that's what makes science interesting. Yep, if I, I like on this intersection of psychology and science, can you apply for funding in the US? Is that something where there are no schemes or I would be curious if this is something that comes into our research? Uh, that's the question that I'm going to find out pretty soon. Definitely not from the Department of Energy, but probably from the National Science Foundation. Great. Um, so there was one more question in the Q and A from um, Lasek Spalik. Um, you can, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Um, thank you very for a great talk, uh, Professor Kalinin. I have a question uh, with regards to bias. Are you not afraid you're introducing bias in your discovery process as a result of using a specific model to guide your search? Uh, yes and no. So you are right that. Uh, I mean, so you are right that if we introduce two rigid priors, we will uh, introduce the bias. So we will find only what we look for, right? Same principle that if you have to fit some function and you can use only a second order polynomial, you cannot discover third order behaviors. That's true. Uh, that said, uh, once you use the probabilistic Gaussian models, they are typically sufficiently flexible to allow for the null answer. So in other words, if none of my model is correct, then the system will behave no worse than a simple data-driven Gaussian process. More importantly, we uh, observe that if, you, if the models that you have include the correct one, the process converges actually very rapidly. So it's almost like measuring the, let's say, lattice parameter in the solid solution, if you figure out that the right model is the linear one, uh, your experiment, kind of the precision of your experiment uh, becomes very large and the uncertainty becomes uh, very small almost from the get-go. If your list of models does not contain the correct one, then the convergence rate becomes very slow. So in some sense, you can almost uh, compare it to the discovery of the laws in astronomy. So Egyptians uh, could predict the uh, 
the phases of the moon's planetary motion based on pure correlation. So the cyclic cycle theory allowed a better prediction, but it still didn't work very well. Uh, only the Newton's laws allowed to extrapolate and uh, build the prediction for the infinite future. So the same thing here, once our model comports to the physics, its predictability becomes much, much higher and we can detect this behavior in the experiment. Thank you very much.